We are back here on Healthy Living. I am proud to introduce to you my friend, Dr. Ross Spires. It's great to see you. Um, Thank you, you know, today we were talking about um, going back to basics a little bit. Yeah. I would love to hear a little bit about where you hail from, uh, your family, and your background and training, if we can. So I was uh, born in central Illinois. Mm -hmm. uh, I moved to Tennessee at a young age. Um, went to high school there, met my wife in high school. Oh, did you uh, really? I did, yeah. Right. We've uh, been married for 25 years yes. uh, this year. Um, and so young. Uh, well, <laughs> um, but uh, went to college in uh, at Tennessee Tech University in, uh, in, in Central Tennessee, um, and then went off to medical school in uh, Eastern Kentucky, in uh, Pikeville, Kentucky at Kentucky College of uh, Osteopathic Medicine, and then did my residency at East Tennessee State University. Did you always want to go into medicine? So I, um, in college, actually was an orderly and became a hospital trained scrub tech. So I was scrubbing surgeries while in college, and I met my mentor and friend um, who delivered our first child. He uh, turned me on to minimally invasive surgery yes. and obstetrics. And when I went to medical school, they said, what kind of doctor do you want to be? And I said, an OBGYN. Did and, you really? And that's what I became, yeah. Did you enjoy other rotations while you were I did, I did. I was actually, uh, I enjoyed neurology, which okay. was interesting. Um, I liked surgery, uh, mm -hmm. general surgery, uh, which is a little bit longer route, uh, but uh, it interested me. Uh, but uh, you know, ultimately, I, I really like the uh, multifaceted aspect of doing a little obstetrics, which is a lot different than other fields of medicine, sure. clinic, um, minimally invasive surgery, big surgery. Uh, so. So, so let's talk about the evolution of your practice and kind of where you were and where you are now. We were talking before we taped that you're doing a lot with robotics. So talk right. to me about robotics and how it has sort of infiltrated the um, OBGYN world. So uh, what's interesting about uh, gynecology is it's always been on the forefront of uh, technological advancement in medicine. I didn't realize that. Mm -hmm. So one of the uh, creators of uh, laparoscopy, a man named Dr. Raul Palmer, uh, back in the 60s and 70s, uh, came up with uh, transvaginal colposcopic uh, minimally invasive procedures to look inside the abdomen. And um, so it's blossomed from there. Um, while I was in residency, mm -hmm. uh, robotic surgery started coming on the scene. Um, and so during my training, uh, I was on the forefront of learning robotics and um, became uh, certified uh, as a, uh, a surgeon, a robotically right. trained surgeon, and somebody who could precept other surgeons after residency. So share with us exactly what robotics mean, look like, and how it works. Because I've, I've talked to people and they're like, oh, what? So I think there's a, some some misconceptions out there. If you of will. course, you know when you hear robot, you yeah, think well like, the robot's oh, doing no my thank surgery, you. right? <laughs> um, so the robot's just a tool. Uh, right. The robot uh, Da Vinci robotic surgery, uh, which was created by a company called Intuitive, has gone through a few different generations, but it's the same concept. So. When we do minimally invasive surgery, uh, we uh, make some poke holes in your belly button and in mm -hmm. other places in your abdomen that are somewhere between five millimeters and a centimeter each. Um, now, once you use the robot, okay. you, you bring the robot over the top of the patient, you hook the robot into those ports that you create, and then I go sit at a console. It's like a really, really expensive, cool video game. Oh, I love this, yeah. Um, so I'm sitting about six feet away from a patient doing the surgery through a binocular view, which gives me a 3D look at the structures oh inside gosh. the uterus. Um, I have full range of motion with the instruments. So as my hands move, the instruments move. So they call it a robot, but I'm the mind behind the robot Correct. doing the surgery. From a precision point of view, I would think that would be amazing. It's unbelievable. You can see so much better than um, traditional mm -hmm. uh, uh, open surgery sure. and even basic laparoscopy. And the, the, the fine uh, uh, grasping and cutting and burning is just unbelievable. What kinds of procedures are appropriate for this minimally, minimally invasive robotic surgery? What are you doing or what are you seeing done? So there's uh, there's procedures I do and then there's procedures that other specialists do. I'll tell you a little bit yeah, about what more, I do first. Yeah, yeah. Um, so uh, we'll do anything from simple ovarian cystectomies or ovarian removal for tumors. Um, 
We'll do uh, fertility surgery, uh, things like myomectomies. Okay, which is? Uh, myomectomy is removal of tumors of the uterus, which okay. could stop you from getting pregnant. Got it. Um, we'll do endometriosis surgery, which is removing scar tissue, burning scar tissue, separating organs if they've stuck to each other, um, evaluating for fertility during those procedures. Um, hysterectomy is one of the major procedures that we do. That's done laparoscopic. It is, all through the robotic. Yeah. Is it really? Yeah, and uh, I've taken out um, uh, uteruses that are up to about 18 to 20 weeks in size with the robot. Uh, oh, wow. Itself, um, all through portholes this big. Um, that has to be an amazing experience. It is. And you know what's really great about it is it aids in the patient getting back to life quicker. Um, the, because? Well, the pain is reduced. An open procedure makes it so you have to stay in the hospital longer. Some people go home same day. Most people go home the next morning from the procedure. Wow. Um, traditionally, when our moms in that age were getting hysterectomies. That was me, 67. Open six, hysterectomy. Oh, six week um, recovery Six week time. recovery for sure. Mm -hmm. In the hospital for two to four days mm -hmm. afterwards. Um, not really doing much for two weeks no. at all. Um, now people are going back to work within a week or two after hysterectomy um, for lifting and heavier jobs, maybe a little bit longer, but pain controls better, back to life is quicker. Oh my gosh. Let me ask you kind of a broad spectrum question about um, the field that you practice. Um, there are so many technical things that you do. Is lifestyle play an important role in the lives of women throughout their ages and how healthy they are and stay? For sure. You know, so um, when we talk about screenings, for example, sure. um, the people that are definitely at higher risk for different types of cancer, specifically cervical and mammogram, are the people that aren't coming in to get checked for those things on a regular basis. You know, uh, cervical cancer is a great example. Uh, cervical cancer worldwide is one of the biggest GYN cancer killers. In the United States, it's one of the lowest because we have access to pap smears and the ability to find these things before they become a problem. So if people are on top of coming to their annual exams, getting their pap smears done, getting their mammograms done, we can pick up on these things before they become too late or too, too life-threatening. Are we lazy or are we afraid? Or are we taking care of everybody else and neglecting? Well, that's the maternal instinct's a big thing, right? So right. I hear that all the time from 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 moms, the matriarchs of the family. You know, oh, the, I had the kids. I had and, my, yeah. I had to take care of so and so and yeah. do this and that. I couldn't get and take my my pap smear. It's 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 a chronic problem, you know. And and and, and cheers to those moms who take care of everybody else. But you got to take care of yourself to be able to take care of everybody. Let me ask you a question then. As we get older, in our sixties, like I said, I'm sixty-seven. Mm -hmm. Does it change how often I need to come? Have the rules changed? Changed. Um, do I still come every year for a routine exam? So a, a routine exam is recommended every year, specifically a breast exam and mm -hmm. a hand pelvic exam. Um, pap smear, um, depending on your age, can be anywhere from uh, every couple of years okay. um, to not at all if you're post hysterectomy. Uh, you know, obviously that depends if you have sure. abnormalities in the past. Um, mammograms uh, currently starting at age 40, if you're low risk, mm -hmm. um, should be done every year or two, depending Bone on densities. risk factors. Bone density depends on risk factors too. So there's actually a, a tool called the FRAX tool that we use where Got we it. plug in risk factors and numbers to figure out when you should start. Generally that starts at age 65, but somebody who has a family history, um, who is slim, who had um, menopause early, Got it. Uh, things like that needs to get that done earlier. I'll tell you what, this is easy, easy. This is our, we're finished. We need more time. Do, it is great to talk to you. It is always fun. It's great because you got a lot of information and you're very user friendly, which I think is important. Well, Debbie, Thank you for joining Thank us. You. Stay with us. There's more to come on Healthy Living.